So let's talk about A to Ds. Um, again, this is going to be a very brief, very high level introduction to analog to digital converters. So A to Ds, or analog to digital converters, essentially what they do, so we're talking about analog to digital converters, or ADCs or A to Ds. Now, what do they do? They basically take an analog input, so their input V in is an analog voltage, and they are trying to produce a digital output based on that. Now, typically, to minimize the quantization noise and making sure that you have the best, um, the least deviation, ideally what you want to have is that if the steps, the, digit, the, the analog steps or resolution is del shown with delta, you want your first step to be actually happening at half a delta. And this makes sure that the line you pass through here would have the least deviation. The line going through the origin will have the least deviation, at least theoretically, ideally, from an ideal line. So, so basically what you would like to see is something like that. And these are the digital words, right? So, so basically this is 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, etc., etc., right? So this is the digital out. This is the analog in. And this is what an ideal A to D should produce. Right? So the first question is that in this process, this process obviously does not reproduce. And, and the output, of course, you can actually show this digital as the integer value or, uh, of 2 to the n analog voltage divided by, well, let's say, Vn divided by the VREF, something like that, right? You can actually, there's a little bit of an offset you can introduce here and there, but that's essentially what it looks like, the digital output. Now, obviously, this is not a reversible process completely, right? Because you lose information. Be how do you lose information? Because this voltage and this voltage and that voltage all appear the same as digital. When, so you do not, you lose some of that information. And in fact, even in the absence of any additional noise, this introduces some error in the signal, right? Which is actually, we call it quantization noise. Because you're basically quantizing, you're creating levels that are discrete, and there's a quanti quantization noise. How much is the quantization noise? Well, if you look at this plot carefully, you will see that the quantization noise looks like this, the, er the error, right, for the quantization. If you look at that error, you will see that the error looks like this. So if you're going steps of delta, and then you're going up a delta over 2, maximum deviation, the way we drew it, is from negative delta over 2 to delta over 2, or a range of input voltages, right? So the question is that what, is the, um, how, what, is, what are the statistics, what are the statistical properties of this quantization noise? Now, generally speaking, this is related to the signal that you put in, right? So it's not completely accurate to talk about it independently as some sort of an independent noise. But there are two things that you can assume that, that would allow you to approximate it as such. One is that if you assume that the input range is much larger than the quantization noise, so your input signal varies a lot, right? Much uh, over a broader range than the actual quantization delta, then you see that you go through a lot of these back and forth. So it's not that you're stuck in around one point, so you have a lot less dependence. And then the, the, the second assumption is that it's not directly controlled or affected by the input. So it's independent of the input. Now, if you make these two assumptions, then you can basically calculate the RMS error or the mean squared value, the power of this quantization noise. So we can actually do that. This is a common calculation. So you can say e -quant the quantization, right, um, magnitude squared is going to be what? It's going to be 1 over delta, so we can actually integrate it over 1 delta range. Integral from negative delta over 2 to delta over 2, right, of what? Of the, the magnitude, this thing magnitude squared, right? EQ squared d e q. Now, it's clear that it's a straight line in this range, right? You're looking at a straight line, so you're basically just doing that, exactly that integrating that quantity, which would give you 1 over delta. This would become uh, eq cubed over 3, the integral of 
x squared is x cubed over 3, evaluated from delta, negative delta over 2 to plus delta over 2. And if when you evaluate this, you will end up with delta squared over 12. Because you get 8, 1 eighth minus 1 eighth, you get minus minus 1 eighth, so you get 1 quarter, and you have a 1 third there, and one of the deltas cancel, so you get delta over 2. So this is the power, if you will, of the quantization noise, right? This is this. On the average, this is the power of the quantization noise. So if you know the power of the quantization noise, we can also estimate what is the power of our signal, the maximum power of our signal, right? So what is the maximum of our power of our signal? The maximum range our signal can have is from 0 to VREF, right? From 0 to, from zero to VREF. Now, if you assume that you have a sinusoid in that range, the amplitude of that sinusoid is VREF over 2, right? So power of the signal, right, uh, you can write it as V squared, right, is going to be what? It's going to be VREF, the amplitude, magnitude squared, divided by 2, which gives you VREF squared over 8. But what is VREF in terms of delta? If you have an n bit, a to d, right, v ref has to be 2 to the power of n times delta if you get the full range. So I can write it as such, and then you can basically you get 2 to the power of 2n delta squared over 8. Uh, yes. So that's your signal power, and that's, your, that's the maximum signal power you can possibly get. And this is the noise power, the quantization noise. So you can now calculate the signal-to-noise ratio, right? So the SNR, which would be V square magnitude squared over the quantization noise power, is going to be 2 to the power of, okay, would be 2 to the power of 2n, um, delta squared over 8 divided by delta squared over 12. So delta squares obviously cancel. What you're left with is 3 halves 2 to the power of 2n. Now in dBs, it would be natural log of this plus a natural, 10 natural log of that. So basically what you get is simply, if you do the power, in the sense, if you take a the, the log of this thing, the SNR would simply be what? It would be 6n if you take the uh, plus 3 in dB. Right? Because what you end up is that you take the log of the 10 log of this is going to be 2n times log of 2, right? which is 3 dB, so it becomes 6 dB times n plus, uh, no, it's not, this is not 3 actually, it's like 1.8, sorry, 1.8 dB. So you can write it this way, let me just rewrite it slightly differently. Say so n times 6 dB plus 1, I think it's 1.8, um, yeah, 1.8 dB, the 3 halves, yeah. So something like that. So that gives you, basically this is the maximum theoretical signal-to-noise ratio that you can get. In the absence of any additional noise, just simply because of the quantization noise, right? If you just purely had quantization noise and nothing else, and your signal was also full range, it goes from zero to VDD, right? This is the maximum signal-to-noise ratio that you can get. So roughly, the, the thing to remember is six times n, right? So if you have a 10-bit ATD, you can expect your signal-to-noise ratio not to exceed 60 dB. Now, practically, a lot of times, ATDs actually get less than that because there's distortion depending on how it's done, there's noise and all those things. So there's this quantity that we call the effective number of bit, bit, bits, ENOB, E-N-O-B. Effective number of bits basically captures, you know, gives you a number that's less than this theoretical limit because of all the other non-idealities. So you may buy a... 24-bit specially designed ATD, which is very specially designed, um, but then you, your ENOP may be 21 bits, or you buy a 16-bit or 12-bit ATD, and then your ENOP may be 10 bits or 10.5 bits. That's what they say, right? 
So you need to kind of think about these things. But this is the limit. You can't expect to get more dynamic range than this. So if you need a dynamic range of like 80 dB, then 8 bits of A to D is not going to be sufficient for you. You need more finer res quantization. So that's one thing. Um, now, so that's kind of like the basic background. The key question now is, that, so, okay, how do we make A to Ds? Again, it's an there are various architectures. So we'll talk about several different architectures as we go. And we'll see a continuum, essentially. It can go actually in multiple directions of variations of these architectures. And there are alternative architectures to that too. So the question is, how do we make an ATD? Let's, let's think about some, something simple. Now, the simplest thing to think about is really you can use a D2A. A lot of times, not always, but mo a lot of times, your source is using some sort of a D2A. Your D2A may be as simple as a comparator. Or, or, or kind of a output of a converter com, com, being converted to something. But a lot of times you use a D2A implicitly or explicitly. But let's start with a, the simplest of the A to D architectures, in my opinion. The simplest of A to D architectures is a comparator, right? If you think about it. It's a one bit A to D. If you set your reference level at VREF, then you have a one bit A to D. Now, what if you need more bits? You remember when we were talking about D2As, we generated these reference branches, for example, a resistive branch, resistive divider branch that could create a different references. What if we do the same thing? What if we have a reference branch, resistive reference, and we take these voltages and use each one of them as a reference point for a comparator? So this is a comparator. And then we'll use this as the, as the negative reference of a comparator. And we continue doing that. You could do it for four if, if you know, if you were for two or four if initially if you are concerned about stuff. I mean, if you want to kind of like see how the concept works. And then all of these inputs would be connected to each other and this is your VN. So what would happen now? So you have a voltage level and you go through comparators. So let's say your voltage level is somewhere around this voltage, a little bit above this voltage, the input voltage. So what happens? This one would produce a 1 because this will switch the, the input voltage is higher than this reference voltage. This one would produce a 1, and everything else would be zeros, right? And now as your input voltage goes up, a different number of the comparators will switch. So you basically have up to a point, if, was, if this were, was working perfectly, there would be 1s up to a point and 0 above that. What are you generating at the input? Thermometer code, right? You're producing thermometer code. And then you can take that thermometer code and convert it to binary. Right? It's, a, it's a combinatorial logic. That you can take the thermometer code and compare it to digital logic. There, there's some even simpler ones that you can do uh, if, you, if you know that this is going to be guaranteed thermometer code. So this is called a flash A to D. Right? So then, then, then basically the output is taken. So let's say you take all of these and then you aggregate them into a Let's say thermometer to binary, and then you produce your n binary bits, d out. So, and these resistors, let's say, are equal, at least nominally. Right? So, you can see that you can make a very relatively simple A to D this way. You're just making different levels and you're comparing them. You've used that you're using the different levels that you have created already in the process of making a D2A, for example, and you're using that to generate your A to D. This is called a flash architecture. Flash A to D. Now, what are the pros and cons of this thing? Let's talk about it. Let's talk about, first of all, in terms of speed. What do you think about the speed of this thing? 
This is going to be pretty darn fast, right? Because all it has is just a comparator and some combinatorial logic. So you can actually send a ton of data. I mean, this is really super fast. Because really, I mean, it's limited to one comparison. And we haven't seen the other ones as a point of reference. Well, we'll see them. We'll see that this is really, as a standalone A2D, this is the fastest A2D because it's really limited to the comparator speed. Everything is happening very parallel. It's highly pa parallel in, in one place, right? Now, what is the disadvantage of this thing? Two to the yeah, you need two to the n comparators, right? So that's large. And it grows out of hand rather quickly. Um, the other thing about it is that, of course, if you have that many comparators, you will burn a fair amount of power. And also, you present a relatively large load to the input, because all of these inputs are in parallel. So the capacitances of all of those inputs are is added at the input. So yes, this is a super fast A2D. And if you know this is your brute force um, muscle A2D, right? Just like, this is just like your heavyweight champion, if you will, right? I mean, this is just this is the one that would do, but it would take up a lot of it eats a lot, uh, takes up a lot of power, and it takes up a lot of area, um, and it's it's also you have to deal with a lot of load capacitance, right? So that's fine. But, and then there are a lot of considerations as far as that's concerned. I mean, the same considerations that we had about the matching of this resistor network or gradients would apply there to, to this A2D2, right? If this this, the voltages that you generate here are not accurate, then garbage in, garbage out, right? You're comparing to the wrong levels, so you will get inaccuracy. Also, if your comparators have su sufficiently large offsets, then you will be in trouble, right? So you want to make sure that your offset, of comparator offsets are below the levels that you actually, the minimum LSV that you talked about. Otherwise, you will create non-idealities. Non, non now, and you can do all the, apply some of the techniques we talked about. You can do offset cancellation. You can do all sorts of other things, or design a comparator, which is intrinsically lower offset, et cetera, et cetera. But you need to deal with all those things. But it's a pretty straightforward, it's kind of like a um, you know, muscle car kind of thing. So let's say you wanted to say, let's say, OK, well, th this is great. This is wonderful. But I don't need really something this fast. And I can't afford to have like you know, 256 or you know, 512 comparators on that chip. What I'm trying to do is doesn't require me to be able to kind of sam do you know, 5 giga sample or 10 giga samples per second uh, or higher with this. But, you know, but I am willing to trade a little bit of speed with a lot of area, perhaps. Can we do something? So can we take a step and say, what if, let's say we wanted to make an 8-bit eight, eight ATD. One option is to do an 8-bit flash, which would require 256 comparators. Right? The other option is to say, what if I gave you two 4-bit flashes? Now, two four-bit flashes have how many comparators? 32, right? 2 times 16, which is a lot less than 256. So if you had two flashes instead of one, can you think of a way to use the two and get the 8-bit resolution? Now, this is where it becomes, the thinking becomes a little bit more algorithmic, right? You have to start thinking about the algorithm. So, so let's say you have a, for the case of sake of argument, four-bit. A to D, let's say it's a fast ABC, right? um, and then and you have two of them. So let's say you have some input voltage. What do you do with that? So if I take the output of the four-bit A to D, what do I have? I have the f if I apply the input to the four-bit A to D, it generates four bits, right? What are these four bits of the eight bits that I want to generate? They're the MSBs, right? The, t the, the most the four most significant bits. So I get the four MSBs, right? The most four significant digits. So I have the four most significant digits. Now, and we know this. So what is left is the four LSBs. How do we generate those? Yes. Uh, in the back and then Dave. You, you, 
If you divide it, do you still get the significant digits, if you think about it? So let's say this is the, this is the input voltage, whatever, right? So if I divide it by 2, I get, you are on the right, I mean, the concept you got is right, but just, if I divide it, I would get this. I won't get the MSPs, right, uh, the LSPs. David. You could use a DAC to produce the result of most significant mm -hmm. and then subtract that from the OK, so what you're suggesting is to use a 4-bit DAC, a digital to analog converter, and convert this back to analog. Oh, well, I really, well, this, this, so I should put this arrows here. So now that I've generated this, what I have is, I've, let's say I've quantized this to these levels. I have actually created what that quanti those coarse quantization corresponds to, right? As an analog signal. What I'm trying to find is the difference at any point, right? I'm trying to find the residue. So how do we find the residue? This is back to analog, right? So we need to now, sub if we subtract this signal, this, um, this, this, what we have generated, this analog signal, from the original signal, right? Do you agree that we've generated the residue, the part that we didn't send, that we did not convert? Because we took the digital signal, the four-bit digital, and then we turned it back to analog, so this is going to be some coarse thing. If I subtract it from my fine delta signal, so what I will get is something like this, right? I mean, in this example. Whatever. Something, right? So now we can actually take our second ATD that we had. And either through some gain or without some gain, so you can actually say, look, you know, if it's exactly the same kind of HD, the range would be the same, so you need to actually multiply it by 16 if you really wanted to get it right. Or you can actually make an HD that deals with smaller. Practically, you don't do that. Basically, practically, you'd make an HD that deals with something smaller. But anyway, you could do this. And then apply it to the, the second 4-bit ADC, right? This is all good and nice except for one thing. It's missing something. The problem is that you, if you just do it the way we drew it, it would not, the input would change in the meantime while, you, while this process is happening. This will take time, right? So you need to basically either do a sample and hold here or delay match this path. You could also introduce an equivalent delay here which is not as easy as you think, <coughs> excuse me, to do that. But let's say you have a sample and hold. So basically you sample the data and keep it here for that duration. Then you do the course. So this is your course, and this is the fine calculation. And this generates your um, four-bit LSPs, right? So what did we trade with what here? Now, is it as fast as the original flash? No. It's not horrible, though, right? Because this is a smaller flash. So it has less load capacitance and things of that sort. So that probably, it's not going to be, it may be even slightly faster than the 8-bit flash. Slightly. But let's say, so let's assume it's the same, same speed. If it's the same speed, then you have the speed of these two, and then you have this guy, right? You have the DAC, which DACs are usually faster than ADCs because a lot of times ADCs use DACs <laughs> in them, right? But um, so essentially something like that. And then, yeah, that subtraction and amplification can be, hap can be happening fast. So on the average, the time it takes for the output to get ready is what? It's twice as, at least twice as long, right? To get all of the eight bits of the output. But there's also some interesting subtlety about this, which is the fact that while after this one is done, the course is done, right? It's sitting idly in the way we are applying things, right? It's sitting doing nothing, waiting for the fine to do its job. Could it start on the next sample in the meantime? 
So what you could do, I mean, that the, the network becomes a little bit more sophisticated, right? Because now you have to have another set. So you need to have a sample and hold to hold this for you. So you need to maintain this. But then you need to switch the input to a different path where another sample and hold with a different clock. So this is clock. This is clock plus delay, right? Is sampling the next one and working on it. And you probably want to also kind of like keep this data as some sort of a register here. You want to latch it here. So this guy can work on that while it's doing that. So once the data is ready, you latch it, you keep it here. You say, OK, D2A start working. You guys start working. I'm going to take another sample, start working with that. So if you could do this perfectly, the throughput of the system would be more or less the same. I mean, a little bit slower, but maybe more or less similar to the flash. But its delay would be larger. Right? Again, that trade off between delay and speed, delay and bandwidth. Right? So, but you see this, and then you think about it. If you think about it a little bit more, you see that, look, there is no reason to stop here, right? You can actually do what? You can actually do this for any arbitrary number of bits and any number of arbitrary times, assuming that you can replicate these things accurately and the noise doesn't accumulate and things of that sort, right? So you can actually take this continuum and go down this path. And what is the end of this pro progression? Yeah, one, one bit, right? Just comparators. And so, by the way, this is called a two-step flash. But if you take this concept and take it farther and farther, then what you will end up having is basically you will have comparators, one bit A to Ds, right? And then you take its output, and then you take subtract it from, and then you basically have a, the proper amplification. Then you subtract it from the residue from the previous stage. And then you feed it to the next stage. You need to you sometimes sometimes you just amplify it. And then you go and repeat the same thing. They need to be properly clocked and timed, right? I mean, so I'm just showing a simplified version of this thing. And each one of these things would produce one of your bits. So what happens, you have to be careful though, right? Because this produces, for example, dn. This produces dn minus 1. And then you keep repeating this till you get to d0 or d1, whatever. Right? Now, but remember, at any point in time, this d, this, this bit, this is the LSP. This is the LSP of eight or uh, n samples back. If it's an eight-bit one, let's say it's eight samples back. This is the that next one is from the second samples back. So these do not correspond to the same sample. They correspond to eight different samples. So you need to buffer these things. The same thing here. You have to actually buffer this here because what is generated in the previous step is the one that goes with this LSP. So now you have this cast code. So you have basically have you have to have eight of these ready, and seven of these ready, and six of them, and then one, and two. And then you take these last ones together, and then the next group together, and the next group together. And each one of them corresponds to your final result. So if result becomes ready in steps, in stages, you get the MSP first, and then over time, you get more and more of it. So usually they're buffered if you get a standalone D8 flash, the pipeline entity, which is, this is what's, what's called. It's called the pipeline ADC. And then you basically, it becomes ready. But you can see that it takes eight steps or n steps to get to this last step to have all of the bits ready. But you will get them at the rate that you can do this process. Because at any point in time, it's working on eight different samples. And now think about it. How many comparators do we have here? Like eight, right? For an eight bit or n. 
as opposed to 2 to the power of n for a flash. So we went from 2 to the n to n. Because what is this really, if you think about it? It's splitting the range in twos, right? It's kind of a binary search. But it's happening in a pipeline. So you go from 2 to the n to n, trying to find the right number. And this is a significant change, right? So instead of 256 comparators, you have eight comparators. Now, why would you ever use a flash A to D if you can do this? We use flash A to Ds still. When would you use a flash A to D? When what matters? Delay, latency, right? If the latency really, really matters, this is not your A to D. And there are cases where it does, and there are cases not that it, it doesn't. Now, we can take this concept in a different direction now. So this is one direction. This is one axis of the spec, uh, you know, movement. We went from flash to pipeline, and it's like breaking it into snippet. But now there's another direction you can take it. The other direction is that, what if you said, look, you know what? I, ha I don't really care about being super fast. I want to make this even smaller. Why do I have to use two 4-bit ATDs? Can I just use one twice? So the idea here is that actually now you do recycling. So you take the output of this thing and bring it, instead of using it again, using another one, you say, look, you know what? I'm willing to wait one extra cycle. This is plenty fast for me already. I can bring it back in to the system and now feed it here. So that needs to stay there. Okay. So it can connect either there or here. Uh, this switch looks really ugly. Um, so you can actually connect here or there and then do it in two cycles. Right? So in the first cycle, your A to D resolves the scores, the, first, the, the, four, the top four, or top n over two bits. And then you amplify it by two to the n over two. You feed it back into the system again. So this is another direction, right? You see, conceptually, we're going in a different direction. We are reusing, we are recycling things. So again, this can also be taken in this direction, in that limit. Where would that take you? If you think about that, where would that take you? One comparator coming back in, onto itself, right? So you can do it with one comparator, one bit A to D, and repeating this process. And that's co often called successive approximation. Um, A to D, SAR, successive approximation reg registers. So, so they, they have a special register. So the way it works is that you have one bit, and then you look at, you start with the MSB being one, and you compare. Say, is it above or below? If it's above, um, my output is above, I still stay one. If my output is below, I, my MSB becomes zero. Then now, the next one, the next most significant bit, I look at it. Is it above or below when I take that residue out? I mean, when I look at the residue, when I take that one bit out, right? Above or below? It's exactly the binary search. Right? You're just looking at splitting into halves. And what it allows you to do is just to basically just, it's taking this and wrapping it on itself, one of the stages. Now, if you do these things, of course, now the speed and latency, I mean, the, 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 the throughput and latency are both low. So now you don't have the advantage. Your throughput has dropped by factor of two because now you're doing it repeating the same thing, or it's dropped by factor of n if you do it here. But you've made something that's really tiny. So if you wanted to trade speed with area and power consumption, that's your way to go. Right? So that's one direction of changing things in ATDs. Now, so, so that becomes successive approximation, and that's it. Now, there are several different other variations on this that we would like to talk about briefly, very briefly. I mean, of course, all of this is very, very brief. Let me ask you an alternative question. What if we wanted to make, what if we, so let's go in the, another direction. 
You're going to go into two or three, uh, two other directions, or three maybe even. Um, what if flash was not fast enough? What if you were trying to make a, I don't know, 100 gigahertz or 100, 150, 100, 250 or 200 giga sample per second oscilloscope, or like 100, no, yeah, 100 gigahertz oscilloscope, 110 gig. Those things exist. People sell them for close to a million dollars. But uh, so it's like 100 gigahertz bandwidth oscilloscope. And even as fast as flash is not enough to do that for you. How would it, are you done? If the, if the, if you, let's say the fastest flash you can get in what you have available to you is like 10 giga sample per second and, I don't know, six bits or, I don't know, let's say eight bits. That's pushing it really. Yeah, yeah, it is pushing it. But at, for today, it may be different 10 years from now. Um, but okay, so what would you get? What how would, would you do? Can you do, are we done? Exactly. Run multiple flashes in parallel with delay in between. Because if you are, if they say there was power and pr price was not an object, right? Let's say you didn't care about how much power you consume. I don't care. Price doesn't matter. Give me an ADD. So that's exactly what you said. So what you need to do, you need to have multiple flashes. And what you do is you, you pr produce sample and hold that are clocked with different delays. So this is clock plus uh, phi1, clock plus phi2. And then you keep repeating it, clock plus phi n and ADC. And what you're doing, you're now making it even more parallel. Because you sample at some point, this guy starts working on it. You sample just immediately after the next guy starts working on it. So they're all staggered, right? And if you, if you time it correctly, by the time you get to the end of the chain, this one's data is ready. It goes out. It's ready for the next conversion. So you can actually make it n times faster. This is called interleaved A to Z. So you can take any A to D and interleave it and make it faster. Now, at some point, you're limited by what now if you're doing this? Well, your sample and hold, of course, has to be able to sample. But what affects the accuracy of this operation? So this is Vn. What's, what's affecting your accuracy of this, this sampling? One of the things that's affecting your accuracy is the, the accuracy of your timing. If you have timing jitter, if you have clock jitter, basically your, time, your edges are not happening exactly at the right time. If they're a little bit offset, if you're Remember, these things are probably spaced very close to each other. At 100 giga sample per second, they're 10 picoseconds apart. So a little bit of deviation can mess it up. So the timing jitter of this thing becomes a limit. So you have to make a very pure clock, very clean clock, to make sure that this kind of things happen in, in, in a reliable fashion. So that's another direction to take this. Now, other directions to take it. Let's think about the flash again. I mean, flash, it's kind of like, in a way, is the mother of all ADCs, right? I mean, so, so basically everything kind of, if you think about it, derives from that. Um, do we really need all of these? What if our comparators were just initial phases of the amplification? So let's, let's think about it as, as an amplifier fire followed by latch. <coughs> so let's get rid of this for now. Let's say just some amplifiers, right? What happens as I slowly, let's say I'm increasing my V in real time and I'm monitoring these analog voltages. So let's say these are now amplifiers. What would I see for each one of them? So this is V in and these are the V outs of each one of these amplifiers. So what I see as I lower, as I increase my amplifier, I see something, well, I see something like this for the first one, and then for the second one, and for the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one, the sixth one, right? If you look at these voltages, that's what you will see, right? So 
what I'm trying to resolve is when this thing, for example, crosses halfway through, right? Some sort of a threshold. By looking at these voltages, if you have, look at more than one of them, can you kind of estimate when, it, when something in, in between happens? So if I wanted to, for example, see what happens when I'm halfway between these two voltages, I could put another resistor, another comparator there, which would make it, I mean, that's basically doubling the number of bits and the number, doubling the number of comparators. Or I could say, look, if I take these two voltages and add them, do you agree that I will divide it by two or average them? Right? Do you agree that I get something like that purple curve? And if I take the next two and average them, would you agree that I get something like that? Well, maybe I can apply this to some sort of a threshold and use it for comparison. So I can, we can apply this to some sort of a latch. We can apply this to some sort of a latch. This is what we did before. But we can also take these two and take an average of that and apply that to an, another latch. So this way, I'm cutting down on the number of amplifiers that I'm using up front by factor of two, right? Using this interpolation. I'm interpolating between these two voltages. This is called interpolating architectures. So you can take a lot of times things that you have generated. You don't need to generate all of them. You have a few of them. You can interpolate between them. And that interpolation allows you to get, a, for example, double the number of bits. Or you can have like a four-way interpolation, right? You can have four resistors, uh, three, uh, one, two, three, yeah, four, uh, three resistors. And then you will have uh, two-way interpolations. Or you can have four, and you can have three in between, right? So you can actually do that. That's interpolation. You, that allows you to increase the number of bits without having to increase the number of all the elements. You're just reusing some of the things that you've already generated. Now, there's another thing you could do. It's another variation, right? So imagine that going back to this concept, imagine that you could have a device. So what, what, what are we doing here, the course and phi, right? We are calculating the residue, right? If you look at the input versus output, the residue calculation, right? How does the residue look like? So if this is the V in and the residue, uh, if you look at it plotted versus input, do you agree that it looks like this? As I increase my input, there will be some residue, residue, till you get to the next course step, and then you get to the next one, right? So the V in versus V out, of course, without anything is straight line, but this basically just like, takes out the course part. You're subtracting the course part. Uh, so this is the residue. Now, what if I had a circuit that could produce this transfer function? Then what you could do, you could have a coarse A to D, and then you have a residue generator, and then feed it to your fine A to D. You don't need to even subtract anything from that, right? All you need is a circuit whose Input, output, DC character, well, like it has to work in high frequency too, but the V in, V out characteristic looks like that. Right? Essentially, you need to, it's called folding because you're folding the input multiple times on itself. Right? So you want to generate, you, the question is that can you generate something? Can you make a circuit that produces something like that? Well, not exactly that, but you can make things that look similar to that. Right? For example, if you have differential amplifiers, this is more commonly done by polars because they have steeper trans transitions. So let's say you have multiple differential amplifiers, right? And they are all Going to, so, so, so now they are connected this way. So let's say there's some sort of a load resistor here. But now you alternate them. So this one connects here. This one connects there. And the next one alternates again. So this one then now, the next one connects here. And this guy goes and connects there. So you see the currents are adding out of phase, right? So you take, keep the tail current sources constant. And then you have a VREF1, VREF2. VREF3, these are the levels where, you know, REF1, REF2, REF3. 
and you let this go through, what you will see is that the current first, as you get close to VRF1, you transition from one side to the other, you go up, and then what happens is that then this one starts kicking in. You go down, you go up, you go down, you go up, you go down. Now, in practice, it will look more like this. But what this does, it gives you a, some sort of a residue. And then what you can do, yes, this is not going to be exact, but you can actually make some digital correction because it's deterministic, right? So it is generating a residue which is not exactly this residue, but it generates some residue that's deterministic related to your residue, and you can always do a reverse calculation in digital domain and correction. These are called folding architectures. There are ways to play with that. Um, so there are a lot of different things. There, uh, this is like, again, like, it's, like I said, this is just scratching the surface, really, and give you a sense. There's a lot more detail. There's a lot of nuances. There are a lot of other architectures and things of that sort that you can do. Um, perhaps the simplest A to D you can make is a counter with a comparator, right? If you think about it, we could, we, we could have started from that. What is it, what is that, how does that work? So imagine that you have a comparator. You have, a, you have a counter, right? So it's a digital counter. And then you feed it, the output of that to a D2A. And then you start counting up. You just basically go up. So the output of the D2A goes up. And then you have a comparator. Right? So this is plus. And this is the minus. So that you have a sample and hold, and this is your VN. I'm sorry, the order of things got a little bit messed up here. But. So what happens is that this generates a zero, right? Until, so let's say there's a clock that's produced here, right? So the clock, let's say you add the clock with the inverse, let's say, like a digital not here of this guy. So you keep clocking it, it keeps going up until your comparator hits it. Basically, so, so, so let's say the voltage you're trying to determine, set, uh, digitize is here. You go here, once you go above that, you stop. Right? This circuit makes it stop. I mean, a very simplistic circuit. So what, at that point, what you have, the output of your digital counter, this, is essentially your A to the output. There are lots and lots of ways to make analog to digital conversion. And what we try to learn from this process today, hopefully, is that there's a spectrum. They're all connected. There's a continuum of these techniques. One way to think about them is that you start from the flash, and you can either go in the direction of making it more pipelined, or you could basically go in the direction of using recycling, using the same block over and over. Or if you want to make it faster, you can interleave it. Or at the same time, there are other clever ways of reducing the number of elements that are used in the A to D. And you can see things are becoming a little bit more algorithmic here. You're just implementing algorithms and hardware, really, when you're doing that. Okay? Any questions?